Yeah, here we go. It's Thursday, week two of the finals. It is the Skeet and Sandover Show. That's right. Uh, Mark Reddings alongside Hamish Brayshaw. Uh, we're here, of course, in the Back Chat Studios, the Shelter Footy Cast. And that was a Southern River band, of course, out of Thorny the Boys, always playing great music. You can jump on and have a listen. Uh, also, socials at Shelter Footy Cast, footycast at shelterbrewing.com.au. You've got the YouTube Back Chat Shelter Footy Cast playlist. It's all there. We've got the bottom art ruffie of the week coming up, which is going to be really tricky given there's only two games. Mm. Uh, start your footy weekend at bottom art. Grab your shelters where Bottom Art has you covered. Uh, first of all, Hamish Brayshaw, first time we've had you on the uh, Shelter Footy Cast as a Sandover medalist. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, yep, it's still sinking in, and you knew this time on Monday night, so uh, Monday morning when we did it last. Yes. So thanks for you held your cover very, very well. Uh, no, it's good. It's been a good couple of days. It's, a, it's still a surreal feeling, but um, no, I'm very, very happy. Did you, you know we spoke on the night... At what point did you start thinking, I'm, um, I'm a couple of lengths clear here, I might might have this field covered? Obviously, by around 19, for what it's worth, you you had the medal wrapped up, yep. but a bit earlier than that, tell us when you thought, oh, hang on. I I sort of, I thought from rounds five to 10 that I wasn't going to poll much. I thought I might get one vote um, through that period of games and, and managed to to poll five and, and got to the 10 round mark at 10 votes. So I was only four clear. I was only four behind um, Alain Murdoch, who was the leader at the time. And I knew he didn't play a lot of the back end of the year. Uh, and I went on a pretty good stretch of games. Um, so I knew that I would poll pretty well. So about the 10 vote mark, 10 round mark, I I started to get a little bit nervous and uh, I started to text Andrew saying, mate, I hope you're tuning in. And this is this could come down to the wire a little bit. And um, then I went 3-3-3 three, three, three and, and jumped ahead to 19 and... Then when I got the um, I got the one vote against East Frio in our loss at the Wacker and and then I knew that I'd, I'd I'd played two pretty good games at the back end so it was yeah about round ten is when I started to get really nervous and then at about round 17, 18, I knew I was uh, I was a pretty good chance yeah hands and heels towards the end they're very nice uh, winning by seven votes which yep. is, is is a terrific <coughs> result uh, most people know your season and how you, what about the the celebrations just give us a glimpse of what the night was like did you catch up I saw obviously Andrew was there your, your parents were asleep but your mum Deb um, was alerted to the fact and so she was like can you and you end up in the, in the casino having a, having a biggie yep. or a quietie it was a reasonably big night we had um, so Andrew and Caleb Sarong have been doing a, having their pre doig medal Nobu dinner tradition or something that they've got going and it's pretty easy to do that when you're winning a lot of money on the doig medal <laughs> uh, so they head over to Nobu and they were there that night and um and he was Andrew was texting me and uh, he was watching the night uh, and he was also keeping mum updated as well and there was actually a really good East Perth contingent there on the night because a lot of the boys thought that the three of us myself Mitch Croyd and Angus Schumacher would poll pretty well which we did um, so they were all there and uh, at about the t- uh, about the 16 vote uh, 16 round mark Andrew had sent me a text saying you know I've spoken to mum and good luck and blah 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 and afterwards uh, I, che- I didn't check my phone for a little bit after I'd, uh, after the fact, but he um, he had texted me a photo. And when uh, when you said, let's be upstanding for the Sando medalist, Andrew, Caleb and their two partners were in the middle of Nobu and stood up and had a glass of wine raised and in the middle of the restaurant um, celebrating. So that was quite funny. Um, so he came out with, uh, with Lizzie for a bit and then we had all the East Perth boys. Mum called me while we were over at the casino. Not a whole lot happening at Crown on a Monday night, no, to in fact, be fair. No, that's uh, an understatement. Yeah, so we went and found a bar in there and there's enough people there to get... So all the East Perth uh, contingent were there. And so Ross McQueen and, yeah. having a drink with yeah. you. And- so it was, uh, it was really good fun and... I- Wrapped up probably two thirty ish, so got home at a reasonable hour and was up and on Media Street on Tuesday morning. Absolutely, just a quick story for my night. Finishing a bit same as you, quarter to eleven. I'm sure like you hadn't, you know, might have had a glass of champagne, yeah. but just under control. Um, I had a room at Crown, um, but I didn't think I'd be staying there because I drove my car there yep. and wanted to get up early. And then of course um, my two daughters decided, oh well, Dad, I'll we'll take the room. Might so as well. so they're up in the room. Uh, said that is, is breakfast included? They said to me, said no, <laughs> I'm not paying for all that. You just <laughs> just uh, sleep in the bed, and that's little fine. did they know your card's already over. <laughs> as it turns out, uh, I bumped into a guy called Paul Higgins, who's a mate of mine, runs a shoe, and uh, a couple of East Perth blokes that so said, come on, we're going to the cast. So I ended up drinking probably not a lot, but enough to mean. So much, be couldn't drive driving. home. So I oh got okay. went up to my room. So I had to sleep, and they weren't that happy about it. Had to sleep in the same bed as my two daughters at 22 <laughs> years of age, which is not a great look for a dad. But I just slept in one little portion yeah. of the bed, got up at six, did breakfast radio like good, yep. you, know, you did, and, uh, and we pushed on through the day. Um, 
Following your Sandover medal victory, that of course came off the back of, now, you know I'm not great on social media. Yep. But is it fair to say, Jaden, in a word, that this man has been trending this week? Uh, in, yeah. in a big way. And yeah. uh, we, Sandover is just one element of it. Uh, yeah. But the big moments of the week, we've talked about your victory on Monday night, but also the big moment of the week has to be reflecting on the, the tribunal case. Yep. You've had you say pre, post, it's been obviously um, a situation where Braden's been cleared, no appeal by the AFL. Is it sort of you're comfortable or not comfortable? You, you know where it's at now and, and moving on? Yeah. Certainly, that's the only way to do it. I mean, I've uh, yeah, I've I've had a few uh, choice words sent to me from a few Collingwood fans across the week, so it's that's been quite... so, so scary, by the yeah, way. Who somehow into the conversation <laughs> yeah, like... said, "If you hate Collingwood, you want Maynard to get uh, yeah, well, get suspended." It's exactly what the uh, the tribunal is about, <laughs> I think. Um, so yeah, I've uh, that's been quite funny to um, to have a little read of every now and again. But no, I've um, I've come to terms with it. I guess. I mean, I, I disagree with the decision, and I'm I can't. You know, it's different, difficult for me to reason with, considering it is my brother. But it's, um, you know, even if it wasn't, and if it was two run-of-the-mill players that had nothing to do with me, and it was a head knock that a guy has decided to leave the ground and um, and made forceful contact with the head that's resulted in a concussion for you know, for the most part this year, that's resulted in see you later. But um, you know, it's it's okay. They, they, that's the point of the tribunal. They are there to deliberate, and they did, and that's their decision. So stick with it, and that's fine. You have to respect the um, the tribunal on that. And then a bit disappointed I was that that the AFL didn't appeal it. Um, I'm sure if it had gone the other way, it would have been appealed. So that was a little bit disappointing. But at the same time, it's I feel like it's finals football, and let's you know let's move on and focus on the good stuff about football. So I can't. I can't knock the decision not to appeal anything and let's just get it and move on. So, yeah, it is um, it is what it is. And, and now and Angus is doing okay. Angus is doing better. I spoke to him yesterday. So, yeah, that's the decision's done and that's really what I care about now. It's been a real polarising issue because a lot of former players said not guilty. Um, a lot said guilty as well. But there was – I couldn't find any – Real, if you're doing a poll, it was very much 50-50 as to what people thought. Now, you obviously were, had a, an emotional attachment. Peter Jess, a, a concussion campaign, he was really upset with the, the decision. But as you say, uh, it's been made. What the AFL now will probably do, though, and there's a fair chance they'll look at a rule like this or, or certainly another case like this, and this could be a change or at least the catalyst for change moving forward. But would that give you some solace that even though there's no suspension here that the AFL might try to close, if not a loophole, certainly just it's concussion again, it's head eye contact. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they are doing, they are trying their best to to narrow down on and making this a safer game for head injuries and understanding it's football and there's always going to be uh, head knocks and there's always going to be injuries and there's nothing you can do to stop that. Um, but the duty of care is on the AFL to, to make sure the players is, are as safe as they can be. And I think this will set a precedent moving forward. I'm, I'm not sure how stringent they'll be with this sort of case happening again. And, you know, if it happens in round three, whoever it does might get reported for three weeks. But it's – I think they're, they're, they're doing the right thing in the way they're looking after the head. And I think that has to be the priority going forward, definitely. Last one on your brother, <coughs> Angus. Now, you said he was getting some scans the other night. Not sure if the results have come through or, or where that sits. But is there a possibility – do you think that he'll play in a prelim final if Melbourne gets there? Uh, I, I don't know. Um I think if if he oh, Melbourne have got to win obviously this mm. week first. Um, at the moment, I think it's probably a normal concussion, maybe a little bit more so. So I, I would say he's probably unlikely to get up for a prelim if if they make it. And um, and if they make a grand final, I feel like he would be more likely than likely to more likely than unlikely to play. But yeah, if they if they win this week and and he makes a prelim and somehow manages to get up, yeah, I'll, I'll go to a packed restaurant and cheers and celebrate with the crowd. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. Don't forget, Dice playing at Shelter, September 22. Get your tickets now at austix.com.au. They are some of the big moments of the weekend as we jump into our finals preview. Uh, Before we just do that, before we get into Melbourne Carlton, Port Giants, um, gee, Crown's been busy with presentations this week, and uh, your brother was back there on, as you say, Tuesday night with the Doig medal. Uh, Caleb Sarog wins, no surprise there, all Australian. Jai Amos wins the Beacon Award, Braden Maynard. Um, of course, takes a back seat from uh, all the headlines for a moment. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on Caleb's year? And I suppose, in many ways, your brother 
he mentioned he had a bit of a knee issue in the early part of the year. I think he was beaten by 43 votes. So he, he's recovered pretty well to, to finish where he did. Yeah, certainly. I thought he, um, looking at it, he, he had... Oh, I can't remember what it exactly was, but he had some knee knee issues for the first probably six or seven rounds and had to get a cortisone in there um, over the bye, and that settled things down quite a bit. But he um, during that time, he still was, I think, almost their second-best player, and, and that was the stage where Caleb sort of came out all guns blazing and was and setting the world alight. So you... Um, you couldn't, you, you can't sort of forget how well he played and, uh, Caleb at that time. But Andrew was sort of ticking along in the background, and then after that, I felt like he was um, he was back to his best self and, and played a really good game, a fo- really good brand of football for the year. But I think there was no real surprises that Sarong was uh, the winner. He he had a fantastic year, all Australian, and in some ways they sort of mirrored each other's years from this to last. So um, it was a sensational year from both of them, and. I thought Andrew picked up and found his best form in the back end of the year, which which saw him come second. But, um, yeah, I think it's a credit to the consistency that he's been able to build over a number of years now. And, um, yeah, he's uh, he'll feature prominently prominently in that award going forward, I'm sure. But, no, it was a very, very well-deserved award by Caleb. Absolutely. Uh, as I said, other winners on the night, and we know that there are life memberships uh, awarded, etc. But uh, bottom line is, Caleb Sorong wins. No surprise, the Doig medal. The Eagles have had theirs last week. Tim Kelly across the line. And speaking of the Eagles... Trevor Nisbet of the football club yesterday, nothing new in the sense that he's basically said prior to this that he's going to step down at the end of next year, which is the end of his contract. But he and and Paul Fitzpatrick maybe stepping through the the timeline or how the process is going to take place. Um, Thoughts? I mean, his record speaks for itself in many ways. Four flags, financially very secure, lots of success. But at the moment, fans are aggrieved and they want some some action and, uh, and Trevor's obviously bearing a brunt of some of the their frustration. Yeah, certainly. It's um it can be lost at the moment given the way that the club is and the situation with the football the team. But um he's arguably the best to ever do it, Nizzy. Um in the whole comp. He's phenomenal. He's been there for I think he's coming up to thirty four years at the footy club. Um and he is he, he's been a stalwart of that club since its inception and the way that he's been able to lead through some real hard times. Um I mean people have said over the last 12 to 24 months that there's been games where we've lost and it's like this is the darkest day in Eagles history and they're quick to forget that period of time that Nizzy was the CEO and had to drag this club and the reputation of this club out of the mud and and it, that was tough and um, and he was there through that all and on the back of that was able to lead to more premiership success and a very su- successful and stable football club. So yes, we've dipped again but and he is at a point in his career where he's Yep, I'm gonna. It's it's the time to hand over to someone new. But he has just been so incredible for that club. He's done more for the football club than than anyone in its history. And he'll be, uh, yeah, he'll be sorely missed. And whoever takes over has got very big shoes to fill. But it's, um, yeah, I think it's the right time for him. And he's pretty happy. He's content in what he's been able to do for this team and this football club. And yeah, he's a um, he's a champion of the place. So we'll, yeah, we'll be greatly missed. Yeah, well summed up. And of course, there'll be a consultancy group and, and lots of people putting their hand up. This is one of the plum jobs in, in Australian sport, let's be honest. Uh, the membership's over $100,000. We mentioned so financial, so successful historically. It's a bit like I would have thought buying a stock that's having a bit of a, a rocky patch. There's only one way for this club to go, and we know how strong they are. That um, And look, guys like Don Pike have been mentioned early doors, um, and that's not from a coaching perspective, that's from a CEO perspective. Um, there'll be others from from business, and I wouldn't suspect they go overseas to get a, a, a candidate. Someone with a footy background. We see look, Collingwood at the moment, Craig Kelly. Um, Tom Harley's done the job in Sydney. Uh, we know Simon Garlick's at the Fremantle Football Club. So do you think it's important to have a bit of a, a footy footy feel as well as a business, a bit of business acumen? Yeah, I feel like that, that is pretty important, especially coming into a, a team with the situation that we're in at the moment. Um, West Coast is, is in a position that regardless of uh, our scoreboard and regardless of our results, we are, we have a lot of members and we've got a massive, we are a massive business and over 100,000 members and winning the wooden spoon still is, you know, a fantastic effort. And he, uh, whoever takes over this job, he or she will have a, you know, need to have some sort of football now to understand the the ins and outs of building the team back to where we have been uh, you know we've been such a juggernaut in making finals year and year and year and it's a um it's become part of the fabric of the footy club that we just are a finals and a successful team so the the football now will need to be there to make sure that things are putting set in the right place for that to happen again but at the same time it's such a mega business and it's been super successful for a long time and you'll need that 
that business smarts to be able to, to facilitate that. So, yeah, I, I imagine it'll be someone with a little bit of um, football background. But, uh, yeah, whoever it is is going to be a big job. Big job. The sound of a man and skeet salute Nizzy about to depart after uh, an amazing tenure as the CEO of the West Coast Eagles. We've taken care of the off-field stuff. This is a shelter footy cast. We're going to talk some finals. Right now, beginning tomorrow night, MCG almost feels like it's been left in the background mm. given what's happening uh, outside of uh, uh, the footy. Melbourne Carlton, 550. Uh, both sides, obviously, for different reasons, have pressure on them. I think Melbourne, though, carry more expectation given they bowed out in the straight sets last last year. And uh, the disappointment of, of going down to Collingwood and butchering chances. Um, how, do you, how do you look at this game, Hammer, with, I guess, changes looming for, for Melbourne given uh, Van Ruyen yep. out suspended and your brother, obviously, yep. uh, with uh, the concussion battle? They've got to make a couple of changes at least. Yeah, they do. Um, I think... I spoke about this on Monday. The biggest change for them, I feel, will be their, the style of ball movement that they've got going inside forward 50 because they really butchered it um, on the weekend. But uh, this is such a danger game for Carlton. I think it's a free hit. You've had, you've won your final. You've got all the emotion out of the way of winning that final and the support is there. They're going to have... It's going to be another packed house. It's already a sellout, I think. And it's um, for them, it's, okay, well, who cares what happens here? We, we, we're right in and amongst it and let's just throw our best punch, whereas Melbourne have that sort of timid nature of we went out in straight sets last year could happen again this year and we you know we probably cost ourselves so there'll be a lot going on in the background for Melbourne um whether they you know whether they want to admit that or not I'm sure they won't but it's um yeah it's a real danger game for them I think I still I think they're the better side but there's um a lot is going in Carlton's favor going into this weekend yeah the Blues won the last match uh, against Melbourne by four points at the MCG that was a night that was tinged in controversy as well with the the touch non-touch on the goal line. Uh, Jack Silvani's been ruled out for Carlton, so too Harry Mackay. So both sides have got to make a couple of changes. Uh, the Blues, these sides, it's fair to say, they sort of play similar footy in terms of their, their midfielders, really, that they generate so much footy. I guess the difference here is that Maxi Gorn will probably have the advantage in, in the ruck. Yeah. Uh, I, I, listening to the, the, I think it was Paddy Cripps and Sam Walsh after the game on the weekend, um, they're a contest side and they want to win the contest and get the ball going forward. Every team is that. That's it's it's pretty hard to distinguish necessarily between the game plans of of all eighteen clubs. Everyone wants to play the same way, and it's it's just who can execute that better. And and the contest is exactly what you need to win. And Melbourne have been doing that for a long period of time. And they're um and Carlton are playing a really good brand of football that is highlighting their ability to win one on one footy. And that's where I think Max Gorn becomes a, a, a massive difference. His ability to to break open that midfield battle and it's it's going to be you know they've got both sides have got exceptional midfielders and there's Carlton have got obviously Brownlow medalist and and Melbourne have got some contenders going forward that can you know possibly win that and they're, they're all stars so I think it's where Gorn sort of separates those two and if Carlton can find a way to nullify his impact and and shark the ball a little bit more as opposed to trying to get it on their own terms it'll be um that'll be probably what they're going to have to look at doing and yeah, it's uh, it's it's certainly going to be. I think that the, the difference is how much Gorn can impact, and he's dominated the last few weeks and really taken it upon himself. And whether Grundy plays or not, he'll um he'll he'll certainly dominate this game. The forward woes for for Melbourne. Let's have a little dive into this. They had 69, 69 inside fifties last week, the second most by any side in a losing final, with the Cats having seventy two in a loss in twenty sixteen. Bear in mind from the twenty seven minute mark of the third term. Until the end of the match, the Demons won the inside 50 count 24 to 4. But they scored 22 points to 3 in that time. That is just not going to get the job done this week. No, it won't. And it is a credit to Collingwood's defence. They are, look, they've got one of the best defences in the comp, and they've, Craig McRae's got a very well, well oiled system in place there to stop scores. Um, and generate runoff half back and all the rest of it. So they're they're flying. So credit to them. But I think it's just the, the method of entry. And for whatever reason, it looked you could feel the momentum going Melbourne's way. And but it just seemed like there was a bit of panic and <clears throat> a bit of get the ball and just pump it in, pump it in, pump it in. And that wasn't working. And I don't think they made the adjustment. And Petrarca was up on the ball and they'd moved him halfway through the third. And he has for you know a lot of this year been a, such a dangerous forward option. <clears throat> that when he's not able to, you know, he's not there or thereabouts because he's kicking the ball in, then you lose a little bit down there. And 
it's um yeah they just needed to change the method and and slow the game down a little bit to to find targets and even if it meant having shots from 50 meters because you're mm. finding finding a lead up forward who can kick it as opposed to bombing it and trying to pluck that one in a thousand from you know a pack of 10 at the 20 meter mark i feel like they've they just had to mix things up a little bit with the momentum going their way and that's i'm sure being around football clubs that's something they would have reviewed going into the week and they can't do that again because that won't hold up in a in a semi final. So they'll um they'll they'll be aware of that and that'll be something they're definitely looking to change. Okay. Uh, that being said, I think you've mentioned you think that the better side on paper you believe is Melbourne or a better team. Yep. Who's winning the the semi final to get through to take on Brisbane at the Gabba? Oh, I think Melbourne win the game. I, I think it's going to be pretty tight and I think it will you know it'll take until the last quarter to break them apart. But I think um, I think Melbourne will just outclass them here. Carlton had a lot of emotion sort of come out of that game last week, and for the supporters, for the players, it was such a breath of fresh air and a relief that they were able to finally win it in September. And it's um it's very very hard to back up a performance like that, and I think Melbourne will just be too good. Well, uh, given there's only two matches, I'm going to give you a, a nice little give here because I'm going to go with the, the uh, bottle mark roughly of the week in this match, which leaves you with probably a good option for the sure. second match. So uh, start your footy weekend at bottle mark, grab your shelters where bottle mart has you covered. So off the back of that, given there's no team over $3, but Carlton at two twenty, if I take them to win by over four goals, thank you, Jaden. That's yeah, a bottle mark. That's a bottle mark roughly of the week. Um, that's me. Blues, I'm not sure they're going to win by more than four, but I think they can be very competitive. Yeah, I like it. Take it. And we're going to take them as our bottom mark roughy of the week. As we go from Friday to Saturday night footy and at the Adelaide Oval, talk about a pressure. We've mentioned uh, Melbourne, straight sets. Well, Port Adelaide, they've been the boom side this year in many ways. They've been top of the table yep. at times. You think they're going to finish top two. They end up, end up missing that top two position, which means they get beaten up at the Gabba, finishing third. The Giants, 540 Saturday at the Adelaide Oval. And Port have won the last three against the Giants, but this Giants side's playing really good footy. They are flying at the moment. My, um, with the exception of Melbourne, obviously the Giants are my favourite team, and uh, and Scoey's all aboard the Giants train as well. So we uh, he we, does jump. He does. He's a bit of a mover and shaker. He is. Scoey. He is. Yeah. But we, we're we're a uh, we're a back chat family over here. And Jack fluid. Buckley, Jack Buckley, the back chat back man of the year. So we're all <laughs> aboard the uh, the Giants train. There's a big big sound, and they are playing good football to match. So they've got. You know, they've got, oh, I think I've said it before, they've got the two two of the best key defenders in the game at the moment. Yep. That duo works really well together, Taylor and Buckley. And and then they've got their midfield is flying and, and the Canelio has to come back in. So that's going to add something. And, and Briggs, as a ruckman, is so underrated. He's just he's just one of those big guys that gets the ball moving forward and is, you know, hard to push around. He's He doesn't star, but he doesn't, you know, he never gives a, poor effort and he'll, he gives his team first look more often than not which is massive in finals and then their forward line is, is jam-packed full of stars Jesse Hogan's playing really good footy Toby Green's obviously a, a star and guys like Bedford and um, and Riccardi as well have stepped up and they've got a lot of good players that are, that are hitting their straps at the right time and it's it's I think they're the informed final side that can really make a rough uh, shake of it in this weekend. And that would be uh, – Port Adelaide are obviously classy and it's at home and it's their top four and it's going to be a hard one for them to lose. But, um, yeah, you've, you've given me an option for bottom up, Ruffy. What are, what are GWS paying at the moment? Uh, they'd be about two twenty, two thirty as well. I think both, both favourites are about $1.60, $1.65. Not that I pay much attention to the odds. Yeah, well, in that case, I think my, I'd have to go similar margin, wouldn't I? GWS by four, that would be enough of a bottle mark, Ruffy. So well, we'll definitely take that. Yeah. Uh, and since round 13, by the way, the Giants have outscored their opponents by almost 21 points per game from intercept possession. So that's ranked number one in the competition. They're doing a lot of things right. And as you say, they'll get Stephen Cornelio back this week, Huge. which can only benefit their midfield run. And that's what really impressed me at the MCG against St Kilda last week. Their link up and run mm -hmm. was quite outstanding. You mentioned their back line. Um, the game, having, to, having to do it the hard way, of course, winning Certainly, interstate yep. for a second week in a row is not going to be easy, something no. easy, but you just get the feeling Adam Kings has got them on the same page. Yeah, I just for, they're all back line to forward line. It just seems there's a lot of synergy in the in the group, and the midfield is linking up really well, and they're, they're offering a lot off, as you said, intercept possession, and, and it helps when your forward line is, is, is firing, and you've got a pillar like Jesse Hogan who is – you know, obviously a class player, and he's able to either win or half the contest. And then you've got guys at the ground level who are who are doing that. And then your X factor in Toby Green, who's who can pop up and, and really break a game open. But they they do look like they're on a, a similar trajectory to the Bulldogs in sixteen. They have real belief in their squad. They've got 
you know, they're playing with a freedom and a lack of fear about what's going to happen. And that sometimes can be the way with teams that finish outside the four. It's it's do or die from the get-go. And they're very much in the mindset of let's just roll the dice and throw everything at this and see what happens. So that's what I think they're playing on. And they're playing on that freedom that Port Adelaide won't have because they'll have the, the fear of what if we go in straight sets? What if we go in straight sets? So it can be a little bit of... Um, of reservation from Port to to play on that massive freedom that you can in a regular season game when they went on that that big run of wins. So it's um yeah it's a it's going to be a tight game and it'll be really fun to watch. I'm looking forward to it. But I think the Giants are just flying at the moment, so they'll be my bottom up by four. Fair enough. Um, just for what it's worth, the uh, recent history, Port Adelaide's won their last two games against the Giants by 55 and 51. So uh, that's home and away stuff. So we do it. but but the one that interests me very briefly is that the power have conceded. Over 100 points five times this season. Now, if you're looking for the DNA of a premiership team, that's, that's not it. it. Yep. No, you're uh, you're right. That isn't it. Um, and yeah, it's uh, you can't be giving up 100 points in a final. What is the rule or something? I think it's first to 90 usually wins. And as Carl gonna... Engler says, first first team to kick 12 goals, which is what you're giving you. It's, it's pretty close to pretty close tip, to the mark. Yeah, pretty close to 90 points. So then you know you factor that in that it's a final, and the last few games in the finals have been pretty low scoring and, and hotly contested. And and if they get broken apart, it, it's just going to be hard to score on the back of that. Um, especially given, as I said, the. The defence of GWS is is has been so strong over the past you know twelve months that if if they can allow a massive score against them and and GWS are kicking somewhere near eighty or ninety points it's it means that they're going to have to do the same to win the game and it's just a hard one that I can, can't really see them doing at the moment so unless Ollie Lord pops up and kicks ten it's going to be a hard one for them to get you know close to that ninety hundred point mark. But the question is Charlie Dixon will he be selected tonight? Of course, massive inclusion if he is. But yep. they got some concerns down back. We know they've got injuries, McKenzie, etc. We know that uh, Jonas has done his calf, so he's not just his season, but his career is done. Yep. is done. So uh, they've got some issues. I, I feel a bit sorry for Port because they've played really good footy. But I'm tipping them to win because most okay. sides, as you know, as you've done with Melbourne, yep. bounce after yeah. having a disappointing qualifying final, all being beaten. And, and no one was more disappointing than Port Adelaide in their qualifying final against Brisbane, who are absolutely flying. Of course, the Collingwood Magpies having a, a breather as well. Uh, this is the Shelter Footy Cast with Skeet and the Sandover Man. Uh, as we uh, jump into some listener questions before we wrap things up on this Thursday, uh, this is... Uh, Desert Rat 84. Okay. Okay. In fact, we'll leave him to last. Sure. Uh, it's it's such a good question. Uh, Wilma says, you've been talking during the week about the finals by, and there's no reward for finishing top of the ladder. Do you think the waffle style finals is better? Top nine finals and first gets a week off. So essentially it's top five though. Um, But but, uh, yeah, do you think there's any any different method that would better suit an AFL Final system. Scully has convinced me, and, and he's turned my uh, my thought process around on this, that the pre-finals buy should be before the grand final. Yeah, but he got that from me, yeah, and who, I got it from someone else. Well, so in that case, that's I, I like that. So I, do I. I. I feel like that's that gives the teams who finish at the end the best. The, the, they get the advantage. I understand what um, what the question's asking about the, the first the, f- the minor premier getting a week off. So in the waffle, the, the, yes. the minor premier gets the first East week Ramel off. Year. East Fremantle get the first week off. And then they play in a qualifying for the grand final next. And I'm not sure. I haven't even looked at what a graph of that would look like for nine teams. So it's it, it becomes tricky. But I think the, um, yeah, I think the benefit should come if not to the first team that finishes, to the to the teams that make the grand final. So I haven't looked at it and been able to, you know, nut it out what it would look like for getting a benefit for that first one. But um, it's certainly something to look at, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the pre-finals. <laughs> but I'm not just – I mean, I mentioned the, the Angus situation with regards to concussion, which will happen in a prelim final. Uh, maybe not as severe as what your brothers had, but I just think let your healthiest – best two teams be available for a grand final. That's my theory as opposed to uh, for week one of the finals. But that uh, is something the AFL I'm sure will look at. Uh, Wilma, thanks for your correspondence. Jamie says what are your thoughts on the crowd reaction every time Adam Saad touches the ball? I was sitting in the nosebleeds for the Eagles-Blues game. Some people commented that people yell boom whenever he touches the ball because he's Muslim. His Wikipedia page says Blues supporters yell woof because of his big left boot. So I may be overthinking it. Um Going back, Ange Christou was a player that used to have that when he kicked the footy. Was that oof? Um, I'm not sure there's anything untoward with no, uh, what I he said for Adam I, I don't think so. And if there was, I, I feel like he would have probably addressed the Carlton yeah. fans and they would have stopped. Uh, I mean, whenever Jacob Van Royen goes near the ball, everyone yells woo. So every, Luke yeah. Bruce kicks the ball, everyone woo. So there's, 
that's just the way it goes. I feel like it adds a little bit to it's the game. It's a feel good. It's, it's a feel it, good sound. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing untoward, Jane. But I understand your question. And uh, look, as you say, as Hammer rightly pointed out, if there was any issues, it'd be Adam Sard who would call it out. Uh, Zach says, "What are your thoughts on the AFL implementing a loan system similar to soccer in Europe for AFL clubs?" And I can say this: I, I read this morning the AFL is looking at a, a mid-season trade as opposed to a draft. They might have both, but the trade mid-season I think would be something that clubs would be certainly. Uh, that have pricked their ears. Yeah, I think so. The loan one is an interesting thing. I mean, other sports do it where you can just say, uh, West Coast player can say, righto, GWS, you can have this player for, you know, six months, 12 months, and I'm not, and then come back. And I'm not sure how that goes. I think the mid-season trade is something that can certainly be looked at and, and can address a lot of issues that clubs have. And um, the, the, issue, the, the way that would help the mid-season draft is that potentially – all the key pillars have gone in the in the national draft, and there is there are obviously players that go in mid season that have that have played good state league footy and potentially have missed the draft. But I think if if it comes to you need a real key pillar for if if your fullback goes down, for example, and and there isn't anything of of real substance at a state league level that potentially you can trade for someone that's that's not going to game. That that I think is something that has a, a lot of merit. The loan system I think is a little bit hard in our game. Yeah, difficult. But uh, I like the idea of thinking outside the square, mm-hmm. and we are taking ideas from. Uh, American sport and potentially uh, from uh, the round ball game as well. Last one to finish up. Uh, we go back to Desert Rat 84. Speaking of trades, how good is it having Hamish or Sandover Man on the show? Any chance of an end of season trade? Will for Hammer just completely wow. smashing Scoey on the way home? Stiff Scoey. No, um, I'm here. For, I'm here off the bench. I'm a, I'm a very willing substitute. When, Tell you what, the if time, and when it's timing needed. was very handy this week. I've got to say, yeah, if and when needed, I'll uh, I'll step off the bench and take a little bit of the heat. So um, no, I'm I'm quite happy to be uh, to be the best six man in the comp. Uh, tell you what, uh, yes, yeah, Scoey, he just it's working the media. Once you t- take a holiday, you may as well just say, listen, boys, um, good luck. Uh, <laughs> Someone's going to take your gig if they get a chance. Um, before we go, Waffle this weekend. I know East Perth, you know, are out, so you don't give a rats. But East, per, East from Adelaide through, it's Subiaco going to, going to Mandra. So am I on Sunday to see yep. uh, uh, Peel Thunder. Who's getting through to the GF? Oh, I think Peel Thunder get it done. They, they've they been flying home. They've, they've come home with a wet sail the last two games that they've played. And they just narrowly missed East Freo on the weekend. And, and Subiaco, I think if they're going to win the game, they're going to have to throw an almighty punch early uh, because with the fitness of the AFL list, Guys and and the way that they're peel are moving the footy there they're they're going to be hard to beat especially down there so oh, my tips peel and um and then I I think they'll go on and get it done okay peel thunder for you and me I think they'll play East from Edel in the grand final of course socials at Shelter Footy Cast Footy Cast at shelterbrewing.com.au uh, YouTube back chat Shelter Footy Cast with the playlist the links are in bio don't forget Dice playing down there at uh, Shelter on September twenty two. Get your tickets uh, pretty soon because I'll run out. Uh, that is oztix.com.au. The long weekend. Hey, Sandover, man. Take a breather. Well Thank played. Thank you very much. Cheers.